Hello and welcome to part two of the Avalanche Awareness Clinic. This is the lecture portion of the uh, rescue clinic that we'll be having in person. So just to kind of give you a preview of what I'll do is I'll just go through a little bit about the, the tools and some information about some assessment. Obviously, we're not going to be digging in the snow and doing any hands-on work with pits and snow crystals and whatnot but I'm just gonna quickly cover some of the steps and thought processes of traveling in the mountains, travel procedures, and then uh, some, some things about having a rescue plan and moving into uh, a, some of the rescue strategies that we'll get to do in person together in a bit. So the first part of going out to the mountains is to be generally educated on the nature of avalanches. This is based, the basis of the first part of the Avalanche Awareness Clinic. Um, we'll be, we're going to talk about forming an opinion before we travel to the mountains, um, using the, your, all the data that's available to constantly uh, uh, confirm or refute the hypothesis or the thoughts you have about the stability of the snow making sure that you have a, a strategic mindset in place before heading out to the mountains. We'll talk a bit about that. Good communication is key. Uh, I have just a basic structure of communication when a, a group is entering avalanche terrain that they can use to help them make effective decisions. Uh, and then also making sure that uh, the group, when it does enter avalanche terrain, observes safe uh, avalanche terrain travel procedures. Also discussing and, and uh, uh, coming up with a, a group rescue plan is gonna be an important part of making sure that things go well and have the rescue equipment with you and have practice with it. And like I said, we're gonna do some hands-on practice with that. It's something that should be done regularly, whether you're a seasoned uh, uh, out, uh, traveler in the mountains or whether you're new to this, uh, practice, practice, practice. Uh, and then also I'll talk just briefly about what to do, how to react defensively if you do happen to get caught in an avalanche. So some of the things that you'll need to have is some of the basics, uh, an avalanche probe, an avalanche shovel, an avalanche transceiver, and also um, a, a inclinometer. This particular one is in compass form. There are cards, there are sighting tools, um, and some people also utilize their phone, certain apps on their phone for some of the angle stuff. There are also um, uh, uh, tools like a sticker you can put on your pole to give you a feel for approximate angles as well, but making sure that you have that basic rescue equipment and that basic equipment that you need. There's plenty of other tools you can bring to the mountains as you start to do pit work and look at things. Uh, you can bring a snow saw to the mountains, uh, crystal cards, uh, uh, block cutters uh, for larger blocks like extended column tests. Um, you, there are specific books for recording uh, avalanche information, um, snow thermometers, loops, which are little crystals, uh, uh, rulers, uh, foldable uh, uh, rulers and things like that. All those things can be helpful at some level, but it, it's not every person doesn't need to do all a huge pit profile every time they go out. There's other ways to gain access to the information. And I'll talk a little bit about some of that as we progress through them. So before we head out to the mountains, we wanna form an opinion about what's happening out there. Some of the ways we're going to do this is we're going to watch long-term weather trends. To some degree, if we operate in the eastern Alaska range in areas that don't have a forecast and don't have a consolidated weather uh, area, we have to do a lot of this on our own. Um, keeping a snow or a weather journal can be an extremely helpful thing. We're going to really look for some of the more extreme weather, extreme winds, melt freeze cycles, rain on snow, long cold periods, followed by snowstorms, some of those kind of weather uh, pieces of information. If there are observations or forecasts, absolutely, that's a very valuable piece of information to, 
to get your whole, your hands on. You also want to talk to the fellow mountain travelers you know. Maybe some folks were out last weekend, have been getting out quite a bit, and we'll, we'll have some valuable information for you as far as what to do and what's happening out there. And then even like on the drive down, I'm watching for clues. I'm watching which direction the wind's coming off ridges. I'm looking for cornices. I'm looking for natural avalanches. Um, I'm, I'm seeing where the wind pillows are on the different features. All, all those things uh, can be really important in, in forming opinion before you even go out. And, and that opinion is then used as a hypothesis that you can use actual snowpack data to refute or, uh, or support. So in the first part of the avalanche awareness, I did talk about strategic mindset. It's just a reminder that you, it's very helpful for making effective decisions if you have sort of a strategic mindset in place before you head out into the mountains. And then you can work on um, adjusting your desires to fit the conditions and the circumstances. I think this is really important. Um, some of the strategic mindsets, again, I'm not going to go into detail because I already chatted about these, but, you know, a lot of times in the Alaska range, if I haven't been out quite a bit in, in recent past, I'm in the assessment mindset. I am, I'm going out there without really knowing what's happening and I'm, I'm spending a lot of time feeling it out, um, staying off avalanche terrain, staying in very low consequence, lower angle stuff until I really see what's happening out in the mountains. When I'm out in the mountains, I will use all the available bullseye stability data to confirm or refute. Generally speaking, we're looking for uh, observations that show instability, not observations that show stability. Um, obviously, if you get everything continually telling you that things are stable, that can be a sign that things are headed that direction. But usually what we're looking for is those signs of instability. So we're, we're looking around those red light clues for, for snowpacks. We're looking for signs of recent avalanches, listening for wolfing snow. We're watching for shooting cracks, which is evidence of that the snow is, uh, contains a lot of energy. We're doing a ski cuts on small slopes as we're going along. Um, many, many times through the day, I'm flipping my pole over and feeling layers in the snowpack as I go along, just to get a feel where those different layers are, those soft, uh, uh, less dense snow, maybe a crust, uh, maybe a rain crust uh, or whatnot in the snowpack and figuring out where that's at, at different elevations as I travel as well. Um, doing a quick hand pit um, uh, next to your skin track as you're traveling along generally only takes 15 to 30 seconds to do something like that. And it could be a valuable tool to continue to refine your, your information about that snowpack. As you're uh, uh, going up, you can cut skin tracks. So you cut a corner a little shallow and see if you can kick off a little slab into the track below. Um, and then also you're listening for, you're watching for wind slab, you're listening for that hollow sounding wind slab snow. And then, the, you know, once in a while when you're on a, a representative aspect and elevation and angle of, of uh, where you are thinking about skiing, a, a quick pit's a great way to um, gain some information. So for me, a quick pit is what I'll use most of the time. I'm not doing a full pit profile with the, all the information, taking temperatures and doing all that stuff super regularly. Um, what I find is that if I can do, uh, I shoot for around 15 minutes for a quick pit uh, to give me a, a lot of information. And I find that if I do um, uh, several quick pits in a day, it overall gives me some of that, the very, gets rid of some of the variables that, that the spatial variability in the snow can, can um, uh, throw at you and gives me more data to work off as far as making decisions. And so generally I'll, I'll use this quick pit model and uh, to, you know, basically I'll start out and try to find a safe, um, uh, not, uh, in hang fire or not under a lot of hazard slope. If it can be between 30 and 40 degrees, that's best because 
that's kind of what I want to assess as far as the stability on. But sometimes a shallower angled slope will work well too to give you the basic information you're looking for. Um, I, I'll dig a pit, basically it's five feet wide, it's, it's about four feet deep, and that gives me enough working room and enough depth to get a feel for most of the layers that I will be impacting as a skier or traveler in the mountains. I'll make the front edge of the uh, pit plumb and, and flat and um, or smooth and, and plumb. And then I'll note the aspect and I will note the angle that the slope is on. That's kind of how I start out with um, a quick pit. Again, this, this little clinic isn't to get you the full uh, lowdown on all the different steps for uh, uh, doing a, a pit or a quick pit. You know, again, this isn't hands-on. This is just a, a quick rundown. So the first thing I'll do is sweep the surface and try to, try to striate the layers. Basically, the softer layers will erode faster. The harder layers will be there. And I start to get a feel for what's happening with some of the layers in the snow. Um, also, swiping a card down will help me get a feel for um, the differences in hardness, differences in layers um, throughout there. And sometimes I can feel layers that I couldn't stride easily um, in terms of uh, the, the brush test. Um, I then, um, once I've isolated some of those layers, I want to know about how hard they are. And really what I'm looking for is big differences in hardness. So if we have some snow that's fist hard and then goes to like pencil hard uh, or knife hard, uh, skips a couple steps in this relative hardness, that, that's something that definitely uh, makes me think. It makes me question what's going on there. Is this an interface that might be problematic? Um, relative hardness test might look something like this. And again, it's sort of helping me pick some layers out and to do some uh, assessment with um, uh, some things. And sometimes I can relate those layers to actual weather events that I've journaled in my weather journal, whether it's a rain crust or a sun crust or some such thing that I can put a date on and start to kind of track the snowpack throughout the season. Um, I find the uh, compression test, uh, which is a 30 centimeter by 30 centimeter isolated block to be a really good test to give me a feel for one, where the weak layers are, and, and uh, but really what it helps me to do as well is get a feel for the fracture character. This is when the snow breaks, how it breaks. And it's really important as far as it, uh, one of the aspects that helps me make some decisions about what's happening with the snowpack. Um, as I go across the face of my pit, after I've cleared out that uh, uh, column test or CT test, I'll typically do an, an ECT test, and this is extended column, it's 90 centimeters long by 30 centimeters deep, and it's down to the base of my pit. And when I do this test, what I'm really concerned about or thinking about is somewhat the fracture character as well, but also the propagation, whether when I do have a fracture in the snow, whether it propagates across the column or not. And this is an important aspect of, of uh, seeing what will happen with a particular snowpack or a particular weak layer sitting upon um, some sort of a bed surface. In addition, occasionally I'll do the propagation saw test. This is when you have a specific weak layer you're just not quite sure what's happening with that weak layer. You've pinpointed it, you've maybe gotten some propagation on it, and you really want to take the next step and sort of see what's happening with it. Um, you isolate a column that's 100 centimeters long by uh, 30 centimeters wide, and you basically run the block and saw through the weak layer to see where, where and when and how it breaks, and this can tell you quite a bit about uh, a specific weak layer within that snowpack and, and what its propensity for um, sliding is. All these things in the quick pit take some personal calibration, they take some uh, additional training, some practice. So this is where the AVI-1 course and onwards come into play, where you're learning these from professionals hands-on in the field. Um, it's, it's something that's difficult to really get a to grasp in uh, this format of a lecture type situation. 
So now that we've uh, talked a little bit about, we formed an opinion before it went down, we've used a bunch of different data to confirm or refute that, we know what our strategic mindset is, and now we need to have a communication strategy within our group before getting into avalanche terrain. So these are some questions that can be a useful kind of outline or starting point for this communication conversation. Overall, we're poor communicators in the mountains, and so sometimes it's nice to have some an outline for this. Is the slope capable of avalanching? So, um, and this is based on, we're, we know we're getting into slopes that are steep enough, so we've measured the slopes. We know we're all gonna be jumping up above the 29th degree slope that we've skied already to a 36 degree slope. Um, so that's an important thing. So it's capable of avalanching at 36 degrees. We know that based on measuring that slope. And then what the uh, slab characteristics are. So this is where some of our assessment comes in. Um, what's happening with the snowpack, what's happening with the weak layers in the slab and whatnot, and talking about it within the group. And then thinking about, okay, so the next question is, what would, it, what would an avalanche look like on this slope? Um, what would the boundaries of this avalanche be? Where would it run out? Like, what would it actually look like? And then we take an even more important step talking about this avalanche, and that's what would the consequence of being in this avalanche on this slope be? So consequences are super important to, to think about. Um, so you're thinking about like the size of the avalanche uh, and you're thinking about um, uh, run, where the runout zone is. We're thinking about the terrain traps and, and different things like that. Um, what's the likelihood of an avalanche? This one is kind of the hardest one because this is where all of our uncertainty comes in. Uh, uh, and this is, is difficult that this is our, what is the avalanche problem and, and what is the sensitivity on this individual slope that we're talking about and looking at? And so this is where the experience and the training and whatnot come into play. Um, but we can have some starting points that we've talked about with, with our steps that we've taken up to this point. And then how confident are we in our assessment? So if we're in the assessment stage mindset when we go down, we haven't been in the mountains in a month or two, um, we might not be confident at all in our assessment. We might have some preliminary data, we might have this hypothesis, but are we very confident in that hypothesis? Maybe, maybe not. Depends on the situation, who we're with, how much we've been out, um, uh, what, our, what our experience and training is in, in that thing. And then what are we going to do about it? What, what, what are some alternatives to skiing this slope? What's our risk tolerance? If we do ski the slope, where are we gonna put our spotters? Where's our safe run out, uh, our safe meetup point at the bottom? Um, and then making sure that we have a group consensus uh, based on whatever we're doing. Uh, it's important to realize that when you're in these situations, consensus is, the, is what we're looking for. Basically, everyone has a vote, everyone has a voice, and everyone has a veto in this kind of a, 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 of a well-formed communication structure. And so I think that's another important aspect to think about before you jump into the avalanche terrain. So there's lots of different ways to talk about uh, avalanche terrain and some of the safe travel methods that we're gonna use if we do decide to take ourselves and our group into avalanche terrain. And um, uh, the, the following is uh, Bruce Temper came up with uh, a, a list of some basic rules for avalanche terrain and travel methods. It's, it's in a teeny bit of a jokey format, but realistically all these rules are super pertinent for what we're talking about. So as we start out, the first rule for safe travel uh, for skiers is thou shalt go one at a time and leave someone in a safe spot. This is that concept I mentioned about having a spotter, having a safe group up area, watching people one at a time travel through these down this slope, through this avalanche terrain. Um, another rule that, uh, you know, I know people who sometimes break, I try not to, is thou shalt not travel alone. Um, if you're in an avalanche, you make a mistake, 
and you have partners, the partners in theory could rescue you. If you don't have partners, no one's coming to rescue you. Um, so that's an important thing to realize. You're not going to probably be able to rescue yourself. Thou shalt have an escape route planned. So before you get onto that slope, if you get out there and you're skiing and the, the slab breaks, you need to think, can I get off this slope? Which way am I heading? It's not always going to work, but if it works, you know, uh, once, it's worth having that risk, that uh, escape route planned. Uh, this is my favorite rule, thou shalt not go first. So um, when you go out with all those super psyched uh, uh, folks and they want to charge that line first, um, you, will, you will do a lot better in the long run if you let them charge it and then you, uh, you get second tracks on that slope. Thou shalt never trust a cornice. Cornices are something that are tricky. They're at the top of a lot of our slopes we're using. They break off way further back than we think. Um, they can be problematic for sure. Or skiing even below a cornice where a cornice could spontaneously break as well. So we have to be thoughtful about cornices. And, and I find this one to be especially important too. Thou shalt be obsessed with consequences. It's super important to always be thinking about uh, pre-mortem. What would happen if a slide happened? Would I be buried 12 feet under? Would I probably end up on top in a nice, smooth, shallow run out? Um, obvious, obviously, no one ever wants to be in an avalanche, but the consequences of the avalanche are super important to consider. Thou shall start with small and work your way up. This isn't jump into the biggest, gnarliest, steepest couloir you can find. This is um, start with those 25 degree slopes, do a bunch of assessment, work your way up to those 30 degree slopes. If you're feeling it, find a small little steeper slope, um, maybe do a ski cut, whatever. You can, you can find ways to work your way into the terrain and not just jump into big complex uh, terrain with, with a lot of consequences and, and potential for big slides. Thou shalt communicate. Slide before, the talk I was talking about is, is uh, focused on how to effectively communicate and you need to come up with a system for with your partners about what you're seeing, what you're feeling, and whatnot. Thou shall have the right equipment, um, effective uh, working, practiced with beacons, and making sure everyone in your group has probes and shovels, trailhead beacon checks, things like that. And then the last one is thou shall not rope up an avalanche train. And this is a tricky one for mountaineers on occasion, but overall um, you don't want to be roped to anyone else uh, in avalanche terrain. So what to do when things go wrong? What to do if you get caught in an avalanche? First thing is let people know, yell avalanche, make sure people see you. Having them see you is hugely important for the next step, the rescue step which is what we'll be practicing in person um, uh, here in, this, in the next part of the clinic. We're gonna wanna fight to get out. Sometimes you could grab onto a tree and let the snow go by you. You could you know, kick down and try to get down to the bed surface and, and have some footing that's not moving underneath you. Um, if you are, if you do have an airbag or an avalon, you wanna deploy your airbags and put in your avalons. Um, uh, if you do get caught in those avalanches. If you're entrained, do some swimming. You know, there's some debate whether how much that works, but basically I like to think of it as like a, a backstroke. Sometimes you're just tumbled in snow and you have you don't know which way's up, which way's down, but sometimes you might be able to stay a little closer to on top with, with some proactive movement. Um, as the slow, snow starts slowing, you're gonna wanna make a, good of a cavity with one arm as you can and reach for the sky with the other arm. Um, it's possible your hand might be something that's popped up out of the snow, it makes it a search easier where they don't even need to use their beacons and probes. They know right where you are, can come dig you out, your partners. Um, you don't always know, but that gives you the best chance of having uh, some extra time under there and maybe be able to be seen on the surface. Um, as you as the snow slows down, additionally, you want to take a deep breath and you want to relax and, and know that you're with competent people and your partners are coming to dig you out. 
Um, they're being relaxed will help you utilize the oxygen you have the best and stay calm in that situation as much as possible. Realize that if you're not the one in the avalanche, you're one of the partners, that you are the rescuers. There's almost never in Alaska here anyone else coming for anything other than a body search. So it needs to be like ingrained in you that you are the person who's gonna be rescuing your partners if they get caught in an avalanche and your partners are gonna be the ones who have to rescue you if you get caught in an avalanche. Um, so making sure that you're, fa you, that you're fast but thinking, not panicked fast. You're, you're going slow to go fast through your search and you have a plan in place, a rescue plan, and you've practiced with that rescue plan. So having a basic rescue plan might look something like, first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is stop and watch. If you can see where they're going in the avalanche, you've got a last known point pinpointed, um, that's what you're gonna to wanna to do. You wanna see as much as you can so that you have the best feel for which way the, the avalanche is flowing, where it's going, where you saw them last, where the clues are. Um, you also want to note the point at which is last seen. And then it's it's time to assess the scene. We want to make sure we don't have put more victims out there. If there's a ton of hang fire right above there, there are times when it's not safe to put a whole rescue group out um, onto a slope that's recently avalanched if it didn't all go. So that's going to be a judgment call, but make sure you don't make more victims um, in this scenario. Uh, everyone should stop and uh, form form a group slash plan. Hopefully you've got your plan in place already. Everyone needs to turn their beacons to uh, search from the transceive mode and the group should organize for a rough transceiver search. Um, I'll show you a picture of this but there's different patterns based on how big the avalanche is and how many people but basically you need to cover the slope so that you don't miss anywhere they could be buried. Your transceiver has a range of, uh, we'll say 15 or 20 meters. And so you don't have to go over every inch of the slope, but you need to spread out in a way where you cover every, uh, with, with that 20 meter radius, you need to be able to cover that whole slope. And again, I'll show you a diagram of that. Um, if you've got, you typically wanna take your stuff with you you might need your puffy coat, you might need your first aid kit. Um, in theory, your shovel and probe are in your pack. So you typically would carry your stuff with you. What you don't want to do is leave a first aid kit hundreds of feet up a slope, or you don't want to leave stuff all over the slope that's going to confuse your clues or your, 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 the things on the slope that might help you find. Um, you want to make sure that you do after you do your rough beacon search, when someone picks up the signal, that you've got an efficient uh, division of labor, that you've thought this through, and maybe even have, uh, if you have enough resources, have someone in the incident commander role who's standing back a little, who's not actively looking at their, their beacon, searching and whatnot, who's like, okay, the two of you deploy your shovels, you deploy your probe. Um, why don't you just check the clues that are on the slope and why don't you, now that you've picked up a signal, why don't you do the regular beacon search and the find beacon search to pinpoint it so that we're efficiently using our resources uh, when we have that. So communication is key for that. And having thought about this and talked about this and practiced this ahead of time um, so that it doesn't become this weird freak out stress reaction that's happening in this kind of a emergency type situation. So this picture would be an example of a couple different configurations of a rough beacon search with multiple searchers. You can see the picture on the left here has um, searchers that are just going straight down the hill and there's enough searchers to cover the whole path. You've got the middle picture with one searcher who's making a, a pattern such that they won't miss any of the locations on there. And then you've got a zigzag type searchers with, with two searchers where they're still covering all the surface area of that. 
And so as soon as someone picks up a signal, assuming there's only one person buried, then um, that person can follow that signal in and, and do a traditional beacon search uh, on its way in. One thing to realize about transceivers is they put out a signal and they put it out, the modern ones put it out in three different directions. So they're three antenna uh, uh, transceivers, but the basic signal comes out with a flux line. And a flux line is kind of like a wave on a pond when you throw a rock in and it comes out in sort of a circular pattern. So as you do a, a transceiver search, you're not gonna necessarily be heading directly bullseye for the, the um, strongest signal or for the center of the signal or the person buried. You're gonna take kind of an arc coming inward as you follow one of those flux lines in. Realize as well that as you pick up a transceiver search, if your transceiver number is going up one direction, so you're walking along a flux line, if you turn directly around and walk the other direction, 180 degrees, that flux line will, you'll be going the other direction and that will, distance will be getting shorter. So this takes a little practice to get used to the fact that they're flux lines. Generally speaking with the transceiver search, um, I will do my far distances. In other words, when I pick it up at 40 meters or 30 meters away, um, I'll get a general feel for direction and I'll move very quickly. As I get down closer to um, my buried partner, um, and I get down into that 10 meter range, I'll start to slow down and be more deliberate. And then there's gonna be a fine search when I get close in. And again, this is something that's really helpful to have some hands on. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about this during the clinic. So one of the worst case scenarios or hardest things is a multiple burial. Now, overall, if you're using safe travel techniques, this doesn't happen very often. But if you mess up, sometimes this is a possibility. Many of the new transceivers have a flag button, which is basically a technological way of muting one of the signals to help you pick up the other signals of, of if there's more than one person buried. Um, and so that's what, what most people will use um, as their method. Um, there's another method called the three circle method for either older beacons or if that particular technology is not working uh, perfectly, you can basically make some circles around your known victim where maybe one, a couple of the folks are digging that person up and you're looking for the second victim and basically staying the same distance with the same orientation around the victim at different distances. And if your beacon picks up a distance that doesn't make sense, like you, you're going around at a six meter circle and you're picking someone up at two meters, that very well could be a, a new signal or a second signal from another buried person. I think practicing multiple burials makes a ton of sense. Um, and like I said, most people will use their technology to help them with this problem, but having a backup method or methodology is, can be helpful as well. So once the fine search has pinpointed the victim to as close as it can be pinpointed, and the three, be the three di uh, direction antennas or the three antenna beacons really pinpoint fairly accurately. Obviously the deeper someone is, the more variable there is. Um, we're gonna start our probing. And so basically the person with the fine uh, search will pinpoint a center location and the probing will begin. You probe all the way down until you hit the ground or, or your victim. Um, and um, people ask, can you tell the difference? Uh, overall, I find if I hit something um, like, uh, mainly I've used like duffel bags with puffy coats in them and stuff. And you can tell the difference between that and like a ground strike or something. So it does take maybe a little practice and feel. You wanna make sure to probe straight up and down in a 25 centimeter um, spiral pattern. And again, we'll practice this um, and I'll show this um, during our rescue clinic. And as soon as you get a strike, you let people know. Generally, I'll just say strike so that folks know. Hopefully I've got a team of, of several people ready to go with shovels. Um, shoveling, working with gravity generally works well. Generally speaking, we want to keep the probe in place. We want to note how deep the, the victim is and start 
that distance or even a, a, a that distance and a half away in the downhill direction and dig into the person and throw snow downhill. It works best uh, because this is hard, hard work and it's very hard, hard snow generally. If you take shifts and you just shovel as hard as you can for two minutes or a minute and then rotate out and move to just below and you can move snow and that and just keep rotating everyone you have. If you're alone, um, dig hard, do the best you can. Um, your, your buddy is, is going to be psyched um, when, when you get to them. So basic summary of a rescue technique or rescue uh, would be to be prepared. Um, have a plan. You're going to want to do speed tempered with safety. You're going to want to have a good leadership structure. Again, if you're alone, you're your own leadership structure. You need to do all this stuff. If you're with a larger group, um, a lot of times an incident commander, um, having specific roles, communicating those roles. Um, and, and people knowing uh, this system uh, will really pay off in terms of time and effectiveness. Um, communication is super key, efficient at allocation of resources. You don't want six people running around with beacons doing searches at the same time when you have one victim. You need people with shovels and probes out. You need people checking clues. You need to have your first aid equipment ready to go, have the scene organized, maybe be calling for, um, uh, you know, for some help if that's available in any sense, whether it's a sat phone in inReach or a cell phone in some cases. You want to make sure that everyone you go out with is a qualified searcher. Those qualified searchers are the ones who in theory need to find you. So that's going to be an important aspect of it. And making sure that everyone in your group always has the necessary equipment. So the three things for sure, everyone's got a probe, everyone's got a shovel, everyone's got a beacon. You take away any of those tools and the time for rescue goes down dramatically. And so it's really important to have all three of those, know how they work and have practice with them. So there are some other things to consider when going in the mountains as well, as far as rescue and avalanches. And, and um, one of the big ones that a lot of uh, avalanche professionals and a lot of recreational users are, are uh, doing is having airbags. And so airbags are have been proven um, over the years to be very effective to prevent um, burials during avalanches. Uh, the idea is kind of the potato chip theory um, as you uh, get caught in an avalanche, you deploy your airbag, your airbag blows up around you, and the main function of the airbag is to make you a bigger surface area. The bigger your surface area, the more likely you are to be on top. It's like shaking a bag of chips. The bigger chips go to the top and get eaten first, but in theory, hopefully, you're on top of the snow. Um, Avalungs, the idea is it goes into your mouth, it's like a little snorkel hose, and basically what it does is it takes the CO2 from your mouth and puts it out in a different place, like in your back or whatever. Typically the snow has enough oxygen to be um, uh, at least somewhat helpful for, for your body if you're buried for a longer period of time, but the CO2 around your uh, uh, face that gets caught in the snow around your face causes asphyxiation and that's what leads to you, your heart stopping and you stopping breathing um, in, a, in a longer term burial. So that's the function of an avalon. Um, and I think these are, are awesome tools. We still need to consider a couple things with them. The consequences, if we're in trees or there's a lot of things that could cause trauma around, many, uh, a fair number of people who die in avalanches die of trauma. An airbag's not going to prevent you from getting trauma from an avalanche. So it's something to consider. They aren't magic bullets that are going to protect you in all situations. The other thing that can happen is someone, instead of being in the assessment mindset, can go to the uh, full-on open country, um, make everything go, I got an airbag, I'm good to go mindset. And I think that's a flaw with the idea of carrying one of these. This is a backup plan for if I mess up. This isn't a backup plan for, oh well, maybe I'll mess up, maybe I won't, um, and, and I'm just gonna go for it. 
because uh, I have an airbag, I'm good to go. So I think it's important to consider that when, when, when using and carrying an airbag. Uh, but that said, they can be very effective in that situation. 